Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus again today. I'm Trace, this is episode five of five in our series this week on domestication. You've made it all the way through, this is the last one. So far this week, we've talked all about domestication of animals, when we started it, did it help us? Was there downsides to domestication? The difference between domestication and taming and if you know, we can take these animals out of the wild, today we're gonna talk about what happens if we put them back. Technology and science have become just so advanced that we can subjugate, I'm using that word knowing full well that it sounds terrible, these animals to do pretty much whatever we want, right? And now people are starting to reverse domestication uh, about saying these animals, we don't need them the way we used to. We don't use them the way we used to. So we should just let them be themselves, which is weird. It's weird, you know? When we started domesticating tens of thousands of years ago, we weren't thinking about a future where we didn't need these animals. We were just trying to survive. There was no malice in domestication. But now that we've got them and we've started to advance in science and technology, it does feel sort of malicious. So there are multiple scientists and multiple researchers working on reverse domestication. Agriculture is a good example. In the 1900s, farmers could only rely on two sources of power other than their own beefy arms. I don't know if farmers were beefy in the 1900s, but either way. Steam engines and draft animals. But steam engines, they were big, they were complicated, you couldn't really move them around, they could explode sometimes, and they were very expensive. Uh, so a lot of North American farmers didn't use steam power. So by 1910, more than 24 million horses and mules were used on American farms. But by World War I, technology had advanced, so both steam and gasoline tractors became more popular. And it came at the right time, because the war, also known as the Great War, caused a shortage of horses. People needed them to fight. And by the 1930s, a majority of power was being replaced with technology. You didn't necessarily need a horse and a plow. You could get a tractor. And this led to a pretty positive impact. It turned out farmers could be more productive and have more productivity. Animals weren't eating up to 20% of the farmer's crops. They didn't have to put that crop back into their horse. They could buy gasoline or work with their steam tractor. They freed millions of farm operators who were routinely managing all of this 24 million horse population. And they could do different things, like relocate into the city, contributing to economies in different ways and do other professions. But also, the landscape of the country began to change. Land that was used to raise and feed the horses needed to work the farms, well, that land could be converted to grassland. It changed the face of America to have this technology and to allow animals to kind of just go their own way. There's also food reasons. Tasty burgers are tasty, and Americans eat a lot of them, and increasingly other parts of the world are starting to eat them too, and that means more cattle. More cattle means more greenhouse gases from cattle production. It also means more feed for that cattle, which increases all sorts of other things. It's this kind of compounding effect, right? What if technology made it so that we didn't need cattle in this way? We didn't need to eat beef like that. We could make beef, but we didn't need to do it with meat farms. It's called schmeat. <laughs> or in vitro meat. It's synthetic meat. It's grown in a lab, which doesn't sound super appetizing, but people have eaten it. According to Maastricht University, it's created by, quote, painlessly harvesting muscle cells from a living cow. Then you dissect each individual cell to be cultured. The cells begin to divide. From one muscle cell, you get a trillion cells. And by dissecting those muscle cells and individual cells, those can be removed and cultured again. The cells will then naturally merge into something called a myotube. It's about a 0 0.03 millimeter Tube. A myotube is then placed in a ring around a column of gel and the muscle of strands contract and grow into a muscle tissue. That was like it in a nutshell, really, really fast. But from these strands, when put together, we get schmeat. <laughs> the benefits are obvious. Livestock release of methane is bad. It's a huge contributor to global warming. Don't have to worry about that. Current meat population and production, not sustainable. As more and more people begin to eat meat around the world and change from a vegetarian diet primarily into a meat-eating diet because people are coming out of poverty and as you come out of poverty, you wanna eat more meat. It tends to be a correlation. So if we wanna continue eating meat, judgment aside, 
this may be our most sustainable option. However, synthetic beef not exactly ready for the grocery store yet. Scientists predict it'll be about two decades to uh, perfect the technology, to pass any regulatory issues, and be able to make this on a scale that people could actually use. To create the first synthetic burger, it cost around $330,000, and it took two years for the scientists to grow that meat so that they could make two patties. But once there's enough meat, a patty can be made in like two hours, so there's a benefit, I guess. Outside of food animals and work animals, there is another common example of domestication that we've touched on throughout this series, our pets. We're not gonna replace your golden retriever with a robot or a Tamagotchi or whatever. However, that's possible. Take Facebook. The platform has redefined what it means to keep a healthy human relationship. So what if technology could revamp a healthy human pet relationship, right? What about our relationship to our animals? Uh, in Japan, in 1999, Sony introduced the Ibo. It was a robotic dog, and for about $2,000, you could own this beagle-like robot. It moved around, it barked, it performed simple tricks. They're actually freaking adorable. You can find YouTube videos of them. And it had an AI in it that would learn behaviors. And the final version of the Ibo claimed to have 60 different emotional states, and it could interact with its owner. Children, when they met the Ibo, would treat it as if it were a real dog. People formed a very strong bond with their robotic animal. Funerals were held once Sony decided they were gonna stop producing and repairing the Ibo. You can find them on eBay. They can go for hundreds or like thousands of dollars, which is really insane. But the point is, do we need thousands, tens of thousands, millions of dogs and cats? if we can do this with robots? Have you ever played with an app on your phone that's a virtual pet? I mean, I grew up in the 90s, so those Tamagotchi things were sweet. I always forgot to feed mine, but that's, doesn't matter. What if our emotional bond is actually the most important, right? You're forming an emotional bond with this animal, and if it's a robot, if it's a virtual animal, is that bond somehow less real? There's also uh, animal testing done in labs. We might not need lab rats anymore, though. Uh, there's this thing called an organ on a chip. It's a revolutionary design. It comes out of Harvard University's Weiss Institute, and they're micro devices that are lined with living human cells, and they mimic the actual tissues and structures and functions and motions of whole organs just from the cells, and they can do livers and lungs and intestines. And if they can do that, they don't need to have thousands upon thousands of rats that are essentially all bred in order to be experimented on. And this means that we could study the effects of drugs, cosmetics, whatever else you would use on rats in a normal lab situation, and you can do that on human organs. Obviously there's more research to be done here, but it's exciting to think about it. And what happens if we get all these substitutions to work? I mean, what if we just left the animals to themselves? It's probably not the best idea, to be honest. I mean, let's think about it for a minute. According to one study, dogs rely on humans so much that they've lost their ability to think for themselves. We've all seen dogs that do this. It's pretty much all dogs. And they fail basic intelligence tests that both wolves and wild dogs will actually pass. But we've bred them so much over the years to be docile and friendly to us that they have lost a lot of their self-sufficiency. One of the tests is they place a bowl of food on the other side of a fence, and to reach the food, all the dog had to do was walk along the fence and go through a door and then walk back down to the food. And domesticated dogs couldn't do it. Instead, they just barked and kind of pawed at the fence. I've read studies that are similar to this where the dog, when it gets confused, looks to the owner for help because we've bred the dog alongside ourselves for so long that now they expect us to save them. It's like a learned helplessness, but it's learned by domestication. And this isn't to say that there aren't successful ways to free animals into the wild. You probably understand a little bit more about this now, so you understand that domestication requires a lot of work to release into the wild, but tame animals, it's different. Dolphins, captured at birth and trained to provide entertainment at dolphin shows, can be released into the wild. Two dolphins named Tom and Misha were kept in small tanks and they were hand fed by their trainers and they were hand fed fish that were already dead. 
This lifestyle decreased their muscle mass, their stamina. It ruined their natural instinct to hunt for food, and it also made them very picky eaters. They would only prefer a very specific kind of mackerel. In order to prepare them for life in the ocean, their trainers began feeding them different things, like sardines, and they'd be like, oh, gross, I don't want it. But it didn't matter if they ate it, to go back to that behavioral training thing, they would give them a mackerel. So they'd be like, here, thanks for eating that sardine. I'm gonna reinforce that by giving you a mackerel. Once the dolphin got used to eating sardines, then you can use that same training technique and train them to hunt by mixing slower fish that had their tails cut off or banged on their head with dead fish so that the fish would move and try and behave more like real fish. And eventually they would only put live healthy fish into their tanks so that the dolphin would have to hunt and catch them. And after consuming all these calories, they had to burn energy. Tom and Misha started to have faster swims and they could jump and they could build muscle mass and they could build stamina and then they were freed into the big blue ocean. They gave them trackers so they could gauge how they were doing and make sure that they weren't you know, gonna be hurt in any way. But this reverse domestication, if you wanna call it that, worked. After six months, specialists said there was enough information to establish that Tom and Misha had adapted to their new lives in the ocean. They were cool, good to go, but it did take to do this with two dolphins, took 20 months, a lot of people, and about a million dollars to complete. Remember, these were tamed animals, not domesticated. So imagine retraining dogs and cows and sheep and pigs and chickens and gerbils and whatever else that we've taken from nature. Imagine retraining them over hundreds of generations to be wild again. Be almost impossible. So for domesticated, we're talking about undoing thousands of generations of genetic and lifestyle changes. We've forever altered these animals, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It almost means like, because we did this, again, without malice, we didn't do this to hurt the animals. We did this because without this tool, without this help, we would never be where we are now. So maybe someday we'll be able to say, hey, animals, I know you're domesticated, so you can't be wild, but we don't necessarily need you for food anymore either. We don't need you to work our fields anymore, but we can still keep you around. We'll protect you, we'll keep you safe, but don't necessarily need to eat you anymore. Might be a good thing. Guys, why don't you go down into the comments and let me know what would happen if we let your pet out into the wild? What do you think it would do? Where would it go? <laughs> uh, and also keep coming back here to Test Tube Plus every week. We're gonna do new episodes. Let us know down in the comments as well or over on Twitter at Test Tube. If you have a show idea for us, we are always looking for new ideas, always trying to push the envelope and figure out new and exciting ways to dive deep into our science here. You can also come find me on Twitter if you want to talk about anything we've discussed on the show. I'm at Trace Dominguez. And um, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Test Tube Plus.